All right, y'all, so now let's finally take a look at the correlation that has always existed in the scriptures between the appearance of the ancient Egyptians and the appearance of the Israelites. And all this is going to do is confirm a couple of sentiments that I've made thus far in this series. That being, of course, the fact that the ancient Egyptians are black or were so-called black Hamitic peoples. And then also the fact that the so-called black man and black woman of the Americas need to stop claiming the history of the ancient Egyptians along with other black um, Hamitic slash African tribes that are mentioned in the scriptures. Tribes like the Chaldeans, the Mesopotamians or Sumerians, uh, the Canaanites slash Phoenicians, etc. Um, because those are not our ancestors. And even though it has become a uh, borderline cliche to say that the black man and black woman of the Americas are the descendants of the nation of Israel because so many people are starting to come to this realization um, and are starting to express it more and more, this is indeed a fact. The nation of Israel are the are the ancestors of the black man and black woman of the Americas. And um, we should understand this to be true just by virtue of the small amount of evidence I've been able to display in this series. Um, where I've showed ancient and very modern examples of Adam and Eve being depicted as two so-called black people. And then their descendants all the way down to Noah and his sons who became the forefathers of pretty much every nation of people on the planet earth today. They were also so-called black, Ham or Kim, uh, Japheth or Yepeth, and Shem or Sem. Those were all black men who once again descended from the same exact father and mother. Okay, so if one of them was so-called black, as we should know by now Ham or Kim was, then the other two logically had to have been black as well or so-called black as well. So we're just going to take a look at and focus on firstly Moses and then um, other notable Israelite figures in the scriptures that are described as being black or so-called black and um, that the Israelites look like their relatively distant cousins, the Egyptians. So before we get started with Moses and how he was described, I just want to dispel certain narratives people have tried to make in an attempt to deflect why Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian. Uh, one of the main ones being that Moses, when he was first looked upon by the daughter of Pharaoh, when she took him out of the Nile, um, was able to immediately discern that Moses was a Hebrew and not an Egyptian. And allegedly this refutes the notion that Moses looked like an Egyptian, but uh, let's read real quick why Pharaoh's daughter was able to distinguish Moses from an Egyptian so easily, because it has nothing to do with how he looked. So now we're going to take a look at Exodus, the first chapter, verses 8 through 9. So now let's read. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. So these two verses are what's going to set the stage for why Moses and other Hebrew children, uh, specifically Hebrew male children, were found in the Nile River. Okay, so now let's take a look at another verse in Exodus chapter 1, verses 22. And just to give a quick background into what went on prior to this verse and um, to give even more context into how Pharaoh's daughter knew Moses was, an, was not an Egyptian child and was able to pinpoint specifically that he was a Hebrew child was because the Pharaoh of Egypt at, the, at, the, at this time, who will go over um, who exactly that was later on in this series, because there is a lot of, in my opinion, unnecessary controversy surrounding who the Pharaoh of Moses' time period was. Okay, but in my opinion, it's not that hard to decipher when you do even just rudimentary biblical and historical research on who the Pharaoh of Mo on, who, on who the Pharaoh of Egypt was during Moses Moses's time period, otherwise known as the Exodus time period was. Okay, but in verse 16, Pharaoh tells the midwives of Israel, who were two women by the name of Shipra and Puya, to kill all of the male Hebrew children and leave all of the females alive. And at first, he tells the two Hebrew midwives, um, and for those of you who don't know, the midwives were basically, um, they were basically women who were, who acted as, um, helpers to deliver the children, okay, but the two midwives were given the orders to kill all of the male Hebrew children upon discovery that they were males, but they refused to do this, so Pharaoh changed his decree and told all of his subjects in order to ensure that the male Israelite population didn't become too vast, they were told to cast them off into the Nile River. Okay, but let's just read Exodus chapter 1 verses 22 to confirm that this is, a, that this is in fact what the text says. So starting at verse 22. 
And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, a.k.a. the Nile River, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So we see here that, that the decree that's given by Pharaoh was to throw all of the Hebrew boys into the river. And of course, this is in reference to the Nile River. Okay, so now let's read how Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses and, and um, put together how she was able to tell that Moses was a Hebrew boy. So let's start out at verse 1. And so it reads, And there went out a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him th for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and dabbed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit that would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Okay, so we see, so we see the river is, is mentioned once again, when it states that Pharaoh's daughter went out to the river to take a bath. Again, the same river that was mentioned in Exodus, the first chapter, verses 22, which was the Nile River. Okay, so now lastly, verse 6, And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Okay, so now we should have a better understanding as to why Pharaoh's daughter could tell Moses was a Hebrew child. She knew because of the, because of the decree that her own father gave, which was to throw all of the Hebrew Israelite male children in the, the Nile River, right? And so she finds Moses, of course, a male Hebrew child in the same river that the Israelite Hebrew boys were supposed to be thrown in. So now it should be obvious or it should be more obvious that the reason why Pharaoh's daughter knew Moses was a Hebrew child and not an Egyptian child wasn't necessarily because he didn't look like an Egyptian, but because of the decree that was given to throw all of the Hebrew slash Israelite boys into the Nile River, which once again is where she found Moses. So logically, she had to have come to the conclusion that Moses was a Hebrew child. Okay, so now that we have this understanding, let's see why Moses was actually confused for an Egyptian. So now we're going to start out at verse 15. And once again, just to give some background on the events that have occurred prior to this verse, uh, Moses has now just fled Egypt after he killed an Egyptian soldier. And when Moses discovers that, or when Pharaoh discovers that Moses killed the soldier, he feels compelled to want to kill Moses. And, you know, um, just as an aside, Pharaoh's desire to kill Moses after Moses had killed a lowly expendable Egyptian foot soldier, as well as the statements that were made by the two, by the two Hebrew men who uh, Moses tried to act as a mediator between uh, the two of them. Uh, but they ended up brushing Moses off and saying in Exodus, the second chapter in the 14th verse, who made you a prince and a judge over us? This statement, along with Pharaoh's desire to kill uh, Moses over some random soldier, should dispel yet another myth about Moses being some sort of high Egyptian official or, pen or a prince, like how he was depicted in the um, animated movie Prince of Egypt, right? He was depicted as some uh, prince who was raised alongside the Pharaoh of the Exodus, like some sort of uh, de facto brother, right? None of those claims have any biblical basis at all whatsoever and are based off of this understanding of Pharaoh's daughter becoming the quote-unquote adoptive mother over Moses, which from my perspective just meant that Moses was held in a higher regard than the rest of the Hebrews that had have, that have been enslaved due to him having the protection of Pharaoh's daughter as her quote-unquote son, but he was never an Egyptian prince or nobleman. Or nobleman and he was never raised alongside Pharaoh like, like he was um, his brother or something. Okay, Moses and his family were most likely on the same level as an average Egyptian citizen, which of course would mean that they had a higher level of prestige than the average Hebrew Israelite slave did. But um, I'll discuss this even further, probably on my second channel, um, which once again is more uh, biblical, which is more centered around biblically based uh, topics. But uh, let's just read this verse now. So starting at verse 15. Now, when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian, and he, and he sat down shepherds by a well. 
Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. And the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them, and watered their flock. And when they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that you are come to so soon today? And they said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. So now we see that the daughters of Reuel, or uh, Jet Jetro, or Jethro, as he was also called, uh, they saw Moses and mistakenly identified him as an Egyptian. Now, using a bit of objectivity, the reasoning as to why the Midianite sisters could have mistaken Moses for an Egyptian could have been due to him wearing the same garments as an Egyptian. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Egyptian style of dress was pretty simple. Uh, most ancient Egyptian men wore no shirt, but would have a skirt-like bottom dress dress that didn't go past the knee called a shindit. Um, but during the time period that Moses resided in ancient Egypt, which most agree was during what was known as the quote-unquote New Kingdom time period in Egypt, uh, the shindits were extended past their knees and much longer and were much longer than the skirts or kilts that were worn during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. Okay, so that's a reasonable argument, but the thing is, Hebrew slash Semitic slave, slaves, which of course is the contingent that Moses belonged to, even though he wasn't a slave, he was still a Hebrew or a Semite, um, the Hebrews and the ancient Egyptians, whether they be regular citizens, soldiers, noblemen, and even pharaohs, were, de were depicted as looking pretty much the same, um, and were even depicted as dressing in a pretty indistinguishable manner from one another in ancient Egypt, Egyptian art and sculpture, so it would have been pretty easy, easy to confuse a Hebrew or a Semite from an Egyptian, because they both dressed the same, and they both, like I said, were depicted as looking the same. Um, but in order to prove this, I'll show a few depictions real quick. So now this first image depicts an ancient Egyptian barber cutting the hair of other Egyptian men. And we see the kilts that I mentioned earlier that was a common style amongst the ancient Egyptian men. Um, particularly during the Old and Middle Kingdom time period, they wore the short skirt-like kilts. Then in the Middle Kingdom is when the kilts started to get longer and go past the knee. And then towards the middle king, I mean, towards the new kingdom is when the kilts started to be pretty much ankle length. Okay, but anyway, when when you look closely, you can see the color of the skin of these Egyptian men is very dark brown uh, for most of them, and uh, the hair on the top of their heads that's being cut looks very much like an afro, right? These are obviously black Hamitic African men in this picture. Okay, but well let's look at another depiction of ancient Egyptian citizens. So now this is a new kingdom wall painting of ancient Egyptian vineyard workers. And again, we see the very dark brown skin along with the seemingly Afro-like hairstyle, except for the man on the far left who seems to have a blonde headdress. And you know, one of the most ridiculous statements that you'll hear about, that you'll hear, pe that you'll hear people make about the ancient Egyptians is that they had naturally blonde and red hair. Like allegedly, um, for example, Ramses II, who, by the way, I'll just come out and say right now, in my opinion, was the pharaoh of Egypt during the Exodus, but I'll talk about that later on. But um, this notion that the ancient Egyptians had naturally red or blonde hair is silly. Most of the time, when an Egyptian was depicted as having blonde or even red hair, it was oftentimes because wigs were worn quite often amongst the ancient Egyptians, even uh, Afro-styled wigs like the ones that these Egyptian men in this painting most likely were wearing. Even though this could be, this could very well be their real hair because as we've already seen in the previous depiction of the Egyptians getting their hair cut by a barber, their hair was naturally in the shape of an Afro. But Afro-styled wigs were the most prevalent amongst the Egyptians and there were also blonde colored wigs as well that were worn by the ancient Egyptians, like the, like the blonde wig that was worn by Queen Hedda Fears II, who was the daughter of the pharaoh who presided over the building of the Great Pyramids of Giza, Khufu, as well as the wife and brother of the pharaoh who built um, the Great Sphinxes in Giza as well, uh, Kefra, you know, and um, also many ancient Egyptians dyed their hair different colors as well. Like, um, people styling their hair is nothing new, especially so-called black people styling their hair and putting dye in it to make it a different color. That's nothing new. 
the ancient Egyptians did, did indeed also dye their hair and in, even in some cases their skin using a substance called um, henna, which is um, a dye that derives from a tree, oftentimes um, that was used to dye and color the hair of the ancient Egyptians or even their wigs as well as their clothes and like I said even their skin too. And then lastly you have the possibility of ancient depictions like this one having the paint chipped, chipped off or the colors being distorted due to age over the course of time. So but this image clearly depicts this person as having blonde hair which once again is most likely a wig and not his actual hair color. Okay, most ancient Egyptians, particularly the male, the young males, they didn't even wear their natural hair. They would oftentimes shave their, their head bald and leave one little lock on the side of their head that was known as a, I believe, a Horus lock, a quote-unquote Horus lock. Okay, so most ancient Egyptians really didn't even have real hair to show off in the first place. Okay, but yeah, that dispels any silly-ass narrative about the ancient Egyptians having blonde or red hair that allegedly DNA evidence shows a blonde slash red hair strain amongst the Egyptians. You know, just silly, silliness like that, that really contradicts their own narrative about what most archeologists and historians have discovered about the Egyptians and their everyday rituals and practices. Okay, but anyway, let's just look at one last depiction of an ancient Egyptian citizen and then compare these depictions to an ancient Egyptian painting of the Israelites while they were in their vassal state in Egypt. So now this last depiction of an ancient e is of an ancient Egyptian carpenter and once again dark brown skin and then his hair has a dread twist kind of style to it kind of like what you see uh, brothers trying to rock today with the um, freeform dread hair style right um, this just goes to show you that there really is nothing new under the sun as the scriptures state in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 9. Right, the same hairstyles Negroes wore wear today are the same hairstyles that were being worn in the ancient world. And not to digress too much, but the Israelites were oftentimes depicted having the quote unquote free form dreadlocks as well. And um even just dreads in general, uh different dread hairstyles in general, but we'll get into that in a little bit in this series, but mainly it will be more so once again on my biblical channel. Okay, but now let's just look at, let's just get the payoff and see how the Egyptians depicted the Israelites. So this is one of the more ancient depictions of Israelite slaves during the over 400 year persecution of Israel in Egypt. And as we can see, the Israelites brandished the same exact dark brown to even reddish dark brown skin color as the ancient Egyptians. And when you look even closer, uh, let me show a, a more close up image of this painting. So when you look closer at the painting, especially at the brothers in the top right corner and even the one in the bottom left corner, they have Afro hairstyles. Some appear to have been bald or it could have been a result from discoloration of the painting since it's, in, since it's so ancient. But there are, these are how the, the ancient Israelite slaves were depicted while they, should, while they sojourned in Egypt. Uh, looking pretty much identical in skin color and even hair type as the ancient Egyptian citizens that I showed and then even the clothing right the the high above the knee kilts that were being worn by the Israelites in this picture are the same exact kilts that were worn particularly by the new kingdom Egyptian vineyard workers so again the Egyptians and the Israelites looked very similar to one another and dressed in a very similar fashion so the fact that Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian could have been due to him being dressed the same as the Egyptians, but it's just as likely that he that he was mistaken for an Egyptian because he looked um, like what any when it, what an ancient Egyptian would have looked like back then. Okay, but let's just look at a few more examples of Semitic peoples looking very similar to Egyptians, just to reinforce the notion that I've broached about Moses being mistaken for an Egyptian because he looked like one. This is an Egyptian figurine of an everyday ancient Egyptian citizen and we can see just by looking at this figurine that the Egyptian citizen is depicted as having that reddish brown skin tone but also he clearly has a very distinct looking afro that without a doubt is an afro hairstyle that this man has so we should already know the ethnicity of this person right he's a so-called black African Hamitic man right and then behind the object that he is carrying, you can see that he has the ancient Egyptian kilt or skirt or shindit 
that was heavily worn by ancient Egyptian men all throughout the ancient all throughout the um, the ancient Egyptian time period. All right, so now let's look at another image of Egyptian citizens. So this second image is of two Egyptian citizens who I believe are making something out of pottery. Yeah, but anyway, we can see that these two Egyptian citizens have dark brown skin. They're wearing their kilts and they clearly look, and they clearly look like two so-called black African Hamitic men. You can see the afro hairstyle. The hair is clearly in the shape of an afro. So it's pretty obvious that these are two so-called black African or their proper name would be Hamite or Hamitic men. So now let's look at one last figurine of an ancient Egyptian. So now this last image is of an ancient Egyptian dignitary from the old Kingdom Six, um, uh, from the old Kingdom Six dynasty. And I mean, if this isn't a so-called black African or Hamitic man, I don't know what is. The dude has waves. 360 waves to be exact from the looks of it and then of course the dark brown skin to go along with it right as well as a clear negro looking nose a very wide negro looking nose so this is clearly a black hamitic or comedic man okay so now let's take a look at a figurine of a semitic slave for comparison of how even the egyptians depicted the semites as looking pretty much indistinguishable from them so now let's take a look so now this is a depiction of a Semitic slave. I'll give you guys a moment to take a look at it and examine the similarities that exist between this figurine and the figurines that we took a look at of ancient Egyptians. Now here's a forward image of the Semitic figurine. Now here is a close up of the Semitic slave. clearly so-called black and this and this is, and is very similar in appearance to the figurines that that um depicted the appearance of the ancient egyptians which clearly displayed negroid physical characteristics the dark brown skin the hair and what's interesting is when you look at this figurine it clearly has the nose chipped off a lot like how a lot of ancient Egyptian mon monuments, statues, and, and uh, sphinxes, like the ones that were made in the days of Khafre, the son of Khufu that I mentioned in my last video and even a little bit ago, that had a lot of the Negroid features distorted by Napoleon's cannons being sh um, shooting off the nose. Right, A similar situation could have occurred with this figurine to obscure the appearance of this Semitic man to make him look more racially ambiguous, but... It could also be just the result of damages to the figurine over the years. But either way, this figurine clearly depicts a so-called black man. And once again, it looks very similar to the, figure, to the figurines that I just displayed of the ancient Egyptians. And just keeping in mind the main central point of what I'm trying to prove here, which is, which is the similarity in appearance between the ancient Egyptians and the Israelites, and why Moses was mistaken for an Egyptian by the Midianite daughters of the priest uh, Re Reuel or Jethro. All right, It wasn't just because he dressed the same as the Egyptians, which by the way, I'm not discounting that being one of the reasons why the Midianite women mistook Moses for an Egyptian, because pretty much all of the Semitic and Hamitic nations of that time period looked the same in that they were all so-called black including the Midianites who descended from the same stock as the Israelites through Abraham um, the Midianites they descended from Abraham and the group of and the group of children he had with his second wife after his first wife um, Sarah had died so they were of the same stock as the Israelites which would mean that they looked similar to the Israelites so one of the only ways that one could distinguish a person who was Semitic and Hamitic um, specifically of an Egyptian lineage was in the way that they dressed because as I stated earlier the ancient Egyptians had a very unique style of dress that was distinct from the way Semitic people dressed during that time period but, none, but nonetheless as I've been able to show through the depictions of the Semites and Egyptians and the comparisons that I've made both of those ethnic groups look the same as one another but just for one more comparison, let's look at a few, but just for um, a couple of other comparisons, let's look at a few more images of what the ancient Semites looked in comparison to the ancient Egyptians. So this is another wooden figurine from the Middle Kingdom circa 1980 to 1730 BC of a seated Egyptian scribe. And again, 
we see the dark brown pigmentation that most of the ancient ancient comedic people had because they were of course so-called black african um this person right here is known as the scribe of divine offerings um mirror um a scribe from the middle kingdom yet again another so-called black african slash uh, hamitic man with dark brown skin and then lastly this figurine is known as an Ush ushapti if i'm not mistaken a, uh, yeah Ush an ushapti which was a figurine used in ancient egypt funerary practices and were believed by the ancient egyptians to be used as servants or minions in the afterlife and um they could be called upon to perform a certain service for a deceased nobleman or even pharaoh okay but anyway we can see that this is once again a black african hamitic person and please keep in mind that most of these figurines are depicting everyday average ancient egyptian citizens which should which should show you that the entire ancient egyptian civilization was mainly comprised of black hamitic peoples okay but anyway let's take a look at another um at ancient semitic depictions for some comparison so now this is a figurine head of a Bedou bedouin man which for those of you who don't know the bedouins are a nomadic arabic tribe who originated in syria and ended up spreading out all over the levantine coast into north africa and even into ancient iraq which was also called ancient Mesopotamia. Now the Bedouins were also, as I stated, Arabic, and the quote-unquote Arabs were also a Semitic people, who, according to traditional biblical history, descended from the seed line of Abraham through the marriage of one of the um, maidservants of Sarah, the Egyptian woman uh, Hagar. And their union, Abraham and Hagar's union, produced one, one son, who became known as Ishmael, and the tribes that sprung forth from Ishmael were tribes like the Nabataeans, um, the sons of Abdil, Mishma, Hadad, and Kadar, as well as several others that are classified as quote-unquote Arabic or um, Arab tribes or nations. Now, um, there's an interesting connection between the Bedouins, which is the Arabic tribe that this man comes from, this man that's depicted, that's, de that's depicted in this figurine comes from, and the tribe of Kadar, where there is a feasible claim that can be made that the Bedouins and the people of Qadar are the same people. And um, the significance of this is that the name Qadar quite literally means black skinned. Okay, and this is something I will delve into a little bit later on when I go over a, um, a certain verse in the book of Song of Songs that also confirms that the Israelites were indeed so-called black people. But with the understanding that the name Qadar means black skinned, and that the peoples that descended from Qadar were the same as the people of the Bedouin tribe, it should make sense why this man has the same has the skin pigmentation that he does, because this guy is even darker than the Egyptian figurines than a lot of the Egyptian figurines that I displayed that depicted ancient Egyptian citizens, who by now we should know to also be a tribe of black, swarthy, sunburnt people, right? By, by virtue just by virtue of their name also meaning black skinned or swarthy skinned right the ancient egyptians name their ancient name was kemet right or kem which we are which we should already know meant black or swarthy and um i don't mean to go on a tangent here but this really just proves my point that the vast majority of people in the ancient world were what we would call today black people Okay, but like I said, I will go over the people of Qadar a little bit later on in this series. But once again, this man clearly is a so-called black man. We can see not only the dark brown, the dark, dark brown skin, um, almost Webley, Wesley Snipes-esque here. And, um, and then he, he also has thick lips, right? This figurine that's depicting this man has thick lips. So this is obviously a black man, right? And then here goes yet another depiction of a Bedouin tribesman who is not as dark brown but still but is still brown skinned nonetheless. And so now here is one last depiction of a Semitic Levantine man and the caption reads Egyptian memorial stone of a mercenary Levantine soldier drinking beer in the company of his of his Egyptian wife and child. Again, an Egyptian wife and child. So now when we look at this picture here, 
we clearly see the, that the Levantine soldier is a black man with dark brown skin, pronounced lips, and what looks to be an afro. And he, once again, looks pretty indistinguishable from his Egyptian wife and son, who we can clearly see are black. Right? The mother has even darker brown skin than the Levantine soldier. Um, I believe um, the Levantine soldier is a Syrian is a Syrian this dude is a Syrian soldier so that would mean that he is of the tribe of Aram so he is an Aramean and the um, the people of Aram or the Arameans they descended from the very last son I believe the fifth son of Shem or Sem so the Syrians or the Arameans they were also Semitic or Shemitic okay so but we get the point the Semitic and Hamitic nations looked pretty much the same as one another which is one of the main reasons why Moses would have been mistaken for an Egyptian who um, we should already know of course that Moses was of the tribe of Levi or at least the people who read the scripture should know that Moses was of the tribe of Levi so in my in my next video we're going to continue with our investigation into why Moses and other Israelites in general were mistaken for Egyptians who we should already who we should already know the Egyptians were a quote unquote black swarthy sunburnt people, right? Just like for example the Kushites, who were their relatives, who are who are already conventionally identified as Negroes for whatever reason, but the Egyptians for whatever reason are not identified as Negroes. But when you look at both of their names, they both mean similar things, right? The Egyptians, um, their name of Kem or Kem or Kam, I should say means black swarthy and sunburnt and then the ancient and then the ancient ethiopians or kushites their name also means black sunburnt or burnt faced right so they were also black sunburnt or burnt faced people just like the ancient egyptians but for whatever reason the kushites are identified as negroes but the egyptians aren't by conventional historians right but anyway uh, but we're going to continue to correlate the ancient Egyptians with the Israelites to prove even further that not only were the Israelites black, but to also help the case that I, as well as many, many others have made over the years in regards to the real ethnic origins of the ancient Egyptians. Okay, understanding why multiple times in the scriptures an Israelite was mistaken for an Egyptian because uh, Moses was not the only Israelite in the scriptures that was mistaken for an Egyptian. Okay, but understanding why the Israelites and the and the Egyptians were so indistinguishable from one another will help give an even greater insight into the ethnic origins of both nations of people. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.